Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to this week's study. As we return to this portion, examining this section of the book of Daniel, shall we be prepared to praise our Heavenly Father for his guidance and lift up our hearts in that he is showing us things that we need to consider so that we may more properly explain the message that he would have us to give at this time. Will you now join me in a word of prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come before you. We know, Father, that we are weak, that we have sinned and we fall short of your glory. But we come before you because as we open this words, we need your guidance so that we may more properly understand that, that you would have us to do. May your spirit attend us so that our minds may be open. May your angels surround us wherever we are. Help and protect us so that we might more properly consider that, that you would have us to know. Guide us in these ways. Direct us now so that your will is done. I thank you for those that are attending this meeting and those that will see this later. And I ask your blessing upon them all. Help us now as we go forward to consider properly and rightly divide the word of truth. For this we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now yesterday we read a portion of Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Now, the next, sen- the next sentence that Smith has, let it be marked that in this year, 508, paganism had so far declined and Catholicism had so far relatively increased in strength that the Catholic Church for the first time waged a successful war against both the civil authority of the empire and the Church of the East which had for the most part embraced the monophosite doctrine. The extermination of 65,000 heretics was the result. Now this word basically means single character. At that time, there were many that believed that Christ could not be fully man and fully God. And their belief was that he had one only manner as he walked upon the earth. With the following extract from Apollos Hale, we close the testimony on this point. We now invite our modern Gamaliels to take a position with us in the place of the sanctuary of paganism, since claimed as the patrimony of St. Peter in 508. We took a few years into, we look a few years into the past, and the rude paganism of the northern barbarians is pouring down upon the normally Christian empire of Western Rome, triumphing everywhere. And its triumphs everywhere distinguished by most savage cruelty. <clears throat> the empire falls and is broken into fragments. One by one, the lords and rulers of these fragments abandon their paganism and profess the Christian faith. In religion, the conquerors are yielding to the conquered. But still, paganism is triumphant. Among its supporters, there is one stern and successful conqueror, Clovis. But soon he also bows before the power of the new faith and becomes its champion. He is still triumphant, but as a hero and conqueror, reaches the zenith at the point we occupy, A.D. 508. In or about the same year, the last important subdivision of the fallen empire is publicly, and by the coronation of its triumphant monarch, Christianized. Um, so, so what, what is he marking here in 508? He's marking the, the, as I would see it, the Christianization of Clovis. Except they usually have his conversion in 496. Now in 508, in December 25th, 
he was baptized, but right. he doesn't know that. Okay. Right. Because that's a new idea. Um, but that's, this is Apollos Hale. So he wouldn't have had that knowledge about the baptism of Clovis in December 25th, 508. But he's okay. saying his coronation of its triumphant monarch. Is he coronated in 508? Is that what he's saying? Does he receive the crown in 508? I don't think so. Oh, no. No. So so he doesn't. So but I'm I'm asking if that's is that what he's saying? I mean it wouldn't be correct correct, but um a lot of the pioneers seem to assume a lot of these Gothic tribes were just coming from paganism. Yeah. And uh there is now there was some that were pagan. I reckon yeah. the Franks the Franks were well certainly Clovis would probably be, come from paganism mm -hmm. because he was if he was being baptized, uh that would sense that that's him just coming into the faith if he had been baptized into some or other sort of Arianism, he may not have been baptized then. You know, they might have said, oh, you're already being baptized, so we're not. But uh, if he was just newly coming into the Christian faith, he may yeah. have heard of Arianism and so forth, but maybe um, he may have considered it before he chose the Catholic faith. Now, there was, Arianism was quite a established, sort of, there was like Christians of all these here, Gothic tribes, with, but with the Arian beliefs. Yeah, and, and it's it. You know, I, I'm I, I've looked a lot into this history of dealing with Arianism and so forth, and it, you know it's not as clear cut as you know it's made out in history. You know who's Arian and who's not, and um, definitely the idea that they're they're all pagan, you know, and that somehow. So we have um, you know the idea that in 508, you know. I guess it's Miller who's saying that, you know, they stop, uh, they make uh, offering of uh, pagan sacrifices in Rome illegal, which there's no evidence for that. Right. And, and then here where it appears that he's talking about like the coronation of Clovis and trying to figure it out. Um, and then he's saying here, the Pope is a recently, it's like, you know, as I said yesterday, it's like, you know, they're throwing mud at the wall and seeing which is which things are going to stick. Uh, just throwing things at the wall to see which things stick. But I think the December 25th, 508 is is really the marker for me uh, that ends, you know, that or, you know, that, that the ends paganism with Clovis's uh, baptism. Now, of course, his conversion probably happened a little bit before that. It's not like he was converted on that day. But, um, you know, so part of the problem that we have here. So at some point, we're going to look at 508 in more detail. I'm not sure when. Uh, I do have Heidi Hike's 508 source book, which, you know, he supports the December 25th, 508 date for the baptism of Clovis. Now, Heidi Hikes is a person who's opposed to the pioneer view of the daily. He has the new view of the daily, but he still tries to preserve 508 and 538 and 1798. So because of that, people have have sort of embraced, you know, who, who wanted to somewhat, somewhat be conservative and, and preserve these prophetic periods. They're going to turn to people like Heidi Hikes with the, his new view of the daily and and think that that sort of can um, justify the rejection of the pioneer view of the daily because we can preserve these dates somehow without it. Right. Which which I don't think he makes a good argument for. I don't think he makes a good argument for the rejection of the pioneer view of the daily. And and. And he always tries to argue, um, I would say dishonestly, regarding Daniel chapter 8, uh, because he he does a lot of bait and switch, and, and he must know what he's doing, that he's tricking people, his sleight of hand. 
So, um, so not really sure what his overall plan is. And of course, he he rejects uh, Revelation nine, Josiah Lich's understanding of Revelation nine. He calls it Satan's counterfeit prophecy. So, so there's something behind all of this that uh, you know that that we have a problem with. So we have the pioneers have even uh, Miller has wrong history to support 508. And the question is, if the pioneers come up with 508, if Miller comes up with 508, and it's correct as a date, but his reasons for it are wrong, how do we understand that? So we see Smith throwing all this stuff at 508, nothing really solid, right? It, it's just like, if, if I throw enough stuff at it, we're just kind of going to accept 508. But, but we can say that none of these arguments at this point that Smith presents really support 508, other than a general period of time. They don't, they don't nail down 508 as a date. So, so how do we address that problem? Can we accept 508 even if Miller's reasoning for 508 is wrong? I think we can. I think it's something that uh, is maybe that God has held his hand over, in a sense, mm -hmm. that history until after mm -hmm. 1989. Yeah. And it, uh, it has begun to be uh, unsealed. Mm -hmm. So, See, that's, so that's, that's, uh, yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah, the pioneers just didn't have the information that we have now to sort of have more clarity as to okay. what God is pointing to, to 508. And even though you sort of said the 508 is paganism, pagan away, um, I think it's it's more like the, it's the sort of, it's not that paganism is just done away with in mm -hmm. Christianity, because I think we know that paganism did continue on to some levels, you know, mm -hmm. within the empire and so forth. But it's kind of marking the point that begins, that's going to impact on the 1260. So mm -hmm. the baptism, the baptism of Clovis really uh, sets the precedent where kings are given their authority over, under, are coming under the sort of uh, supporting the papacy and mm -hmm. sort of giving that power to the papacy, which enables the papacy. Then uh, sort of begins that twelve hundred and sixty years that just dominate Europe. And uh, other areas in the world as well. Yeah. But, um, it, it's sort of, it's more than that. It's like a key event. When, 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 uh, and, and you're asked, Smith, he talked about the baptism of paganism with, um, going on in that history, uh, which is relating to the Catholic faith. So in the yeah, sense, paganism baptized. Baptized. yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> it's sort of with baptism of Clovis, it's kind of like symbolizing that. As well, mm -hmm. and and I think that the twenty fifth of December as well is a an interesting date. You have sort of um, connected with this like this winter solstice, the sun being uh, reborn some way. Well, you know, the date I was baptized. <laughs> yes, not by design. Um, yes. So even though it may not seem a big deal someone getting baptized how's that a you know just someone getting baptized why why is god marking that but it has uh, has such rep, rep, uh, repercussions on the the history for the, the hmm. next thousand odd years that i think it's it has it's a, it's a worthy event to for that god is marking that is showing us this year time Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when we look at how God has led, you know, he has led the Advent movement, you know, even if we look at something like Josiah Lich's prophecy, where Josiah Lich gets the right date, we, we could almost say by, by accident, right? That is, he doesn't understand the 26th day of the fourth month on the biblical calendar. He doesn't understand the biblical calendar at all when he makes his prediction. And yet the biblical calendar lines up with his prediction in remarkable ways. 
just in, impossible to have been a coincidence. He has no knowledge of that. God just leads him, right? And 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 we can see how God even has led this movement in in sort of what we would call accidental ways. That is, there are things that we have found we don't understand the significance of, but later on we do. And and so, you know, we as human beings, we sort of fumble through, you know, our lives, stumble along this journey. But God's hand, his providential hand, continues to lead. And so Miller was given 508, just as he was given 677. He didn't know about Prism B and, and how to prove 677. All he had was just a date, you know, from, uh, you know, from Usher, basically. Uh, 457, he didn't really even understand 457 and how that date worked. Um, you know, he didn't understand the no zero year, right? He had 33 AD for the baptism of Christ instead of 31. I mean, not the baptism, the crucifixion of Christ instead of 31 AD, right? Um, he didn't mark the stoning of Stephen as the end of the 70 weeks, right? He just marked the baptism of Christ as the end of the 70 weeks. So, so we could look at all of these, what we would call mistakes. They're not really mistakes because God is leading and putting things in place. Now, some people have a problem where they say, well, the pioneers must have been correct um, about things like, for instance, Samuel Snow, you know, he has the 6,000 years ending in 1844. So does Miller, sort of in 1843. And, and so people say, well, Ellen White endorsed uh, Samuel Snow's True Midnight Cry. So that must be correct, even though it contradicts Ellen White's chronology. Right. So when we have this advancing of truth, we can see how this refinement isn't a rejection of the old, but it's actually a deeper understanding. It's a clearer argument. So the fact that we have clearer arguments for 508 and, and that are more significant and they show, they show how Bible prophecy works. Pro Bible prophecy doesn't really work like man thinks. That is, you know, we just say, well, the daily is taken out of the way. The daily is paganism, so paganism is removed. But we understand it's it's more symbolic than that, right? Paganism, you know, still exists, and, and it started to be removed a lot earlier. So you have to, why do we have that date, by the way? Or even the fall of Islam, August 11th, 1840. Well, obviously, Islam continued. So we need to understand prophetically how the Bible looks at prophecy. Um, and how we look at, you know, the rise and fall of empires. It's obviously not the way secular history would look at it. So we have lots of precedent for accepting 508 on a different basis than we had accepted it before. But we wouldn't reject the pioneer view of the daily. In a sense, we, we amplify the pioneer view of the daily. We see it in much clearer terms. We can see it as a period of 1260 years. It has that 30 years at the end of it that's going to mark that period, just like the 30 years of Christ from 508 to 538 for the papacy. Um, you know, there's there's everything just continues to fall into place, even in, in this refining. So it's not a rejection. It's it's totally consistent with how God has led, especially after 1989, the light that he's given us. Dwight? Okay. <clears throat> the pontiff for the period on which we stand is a recently converted pagan. Now, when we're looking at something like this, and we are considering that this recently converted pagan. This pope at the time, which was, what was his name again? Zamachus. Yeah, now... And see, that really would have nothing to do with 508, because it's not like he's marking 508. I mean, he's in that period. Well, he was he was elected as Pope on the 22nd of November of 498. Yeah, so 10 years uh, before 508. 
Correct. And as, as we look at this, is papacy ended on the 19th of July, 514. Mm-hmm. So he did call different synods or synod, however you want to pronounce that. So he called what's called the Roman Synod number one, the Arminium Synod number number two, the Roman Synod number three, Palmyra's Synod number four in 502. So there's quite a bit that this one person decided needed to be addressed. They needed to assess, you know, exactly what they were they were to be doing and how they were to be doing it. So the bloody contest which placed Hint in the chair was decided by the interposition of an Aryan king. He is bowed to and saluted as filling the place of God on earth. Senate is so far under his power that on suspicion that the interests of the See of Rome demand it, they excommunicate the emperor. In 508, the mine is sprung beneath the throne of the Eastern Empire. The result of confusion and strife it occasions is the humiliation of its rightful lord. Now the question is, at what time was paganism so far suppressed as to make room for its substitute and successor, the papal abomination? When was this abomination placed in a position to start on its career of blasphemy and blood? Is there any other date for its being placed or set up in the room of paganism but 508? If the mysterious enchantress has not now brought all her victims within her power, she has taken her position and some have yielded to the fascination. The others are at length subdued and kings and peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues are brought under the spell which prepares them, even while drunken with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, to think that they are doing God's service and to fancy themselves the exclusive favorites of heaven, while becoming an easier and richer prey for the damnation of hell. Yeah, so he doesn't really give a good argument here for 508. No, he doesn't. Right? It's like, well, we have all of these events grouped in in that period, but yeah, 508 needs to be the one. So they don't have an event, they don't have anything that really gives us 508. So so when he says, for, from these evidences, we think it clear that the daily or paganism was taken away in 508, even though he hasn't given us anything to show that. And this was preparatory to the setting up or establishment of the papacy, which was separate and subsequent event of this we'll speak in our next. So, so he, he's mostly just arguing well, since since the seventeen, you know, the twelve sixty and the seventeen ninety eight must must end together, that he's sort of inferring back to five oh eight. It's like, well, it's got to be around five oh eight because it's got to end in seventeen ninety eight. But he hasn't really given us anything that proves five oh eight on its own, right? right? That even would give us five oh eight. Now, our situation here. There are multiple popes from Simonicus to Pope Vigilius or Vigilus. So in this, in this period, there are a, no, a number of different ideas and a number of different men that are selected then as the Bishop of Rome. Now, the Pope that was, that was selected for 538 became Bishop of Rome on the 29th of March of 537. He was allied with Empress Theodora, who was of the Eastern Church, 
and Empress Theodora sought his help to establish monophysitism and was made Pope after the deposition or the deposing of Silvarius. After he refused to sign Emperor Justinian the first edict condemning the three chapters, Vigilus was arrested in 545 and taken to Constantinople. He died in Sicily while returning to Rome. He is not made a good argument for 508, and he has not set the stage at all for 538. I also find this interesting that this is one of the first of the articles that Uriah Smith places not only a date, but a title as editor of the Advent Review and and Sabbath Herald. His last statement, from these evidences, we think it clear that the daily or paganism was taken away in 508. This was preparatory to the setting up of the establishment of the papacy, which was a separate and subsequent event. Of this, we will speak in our next. So, any other questions or comments? I mean, I've probably said enough about it already. Okay. Yeah, it's just, so, you know, we're going to look at this in more detail. Stephen's going to give us a study on it at some point here. We'll figure out when. Okay. Now, a week later, on the 7th of March of 1871, the 15th day of the 12th month, Smith's articles continue. And they shall place the abomination which maketh desolate. Having shown quite fully what constituted the taking away of the daily or paganism, we now inquire when was the abomination that maketh desolate or the papacy placed or set up. The little horn that had eyes like the eyes of a man was not slow to see what the way was open for his advancement and elevation. From the year 508, its progress toward universal supremacy was without parallel. When Justinian was about to commence the Vandal War in AD 533, an enterprise of no small magnitude and difficulty, he wished to secure the influence of the Bishop of Rome, who had then attained a position in which his opinion had great weight throughout a large portion of Christendom. Justinian therefore took it upon himself to decide the contest which had long existed between the seas of Rome and Constantinople, and to to which should have been the precedency by giving preference to Rome and declaring in the fullest and the most unequivocal, unequivocal terms that the bishop of that city should be the chief of the whole ecclesiastical body of the empire. A work on the apocalypse by Reverend George Crawley of England, published in 1827, gives a detailed account of the events by which the supremacy of the Pope of Rome was secured. He gives the following as the terms in which the decree of Justinian was expressed. Justinian pious, fortunate, renowned, triumphant emperor, council, continued to John, the most holy archbishop of our city of Rome, patriarch, rendering honor to the apostolic chair and to your holiness, as has been always, and is our wish, and honoring your blessedness as a father, we have hastened to bring to the knowledge of your holiness all matters relating to the state of the churches, it having been at all times our great desire to preserve the unity of your apostolic chair and the constitution of the holy churches of God, which has obtained hitherto and still obtains. Therefore, we have made no delay in subjecting and uniting to your holiness all the priests of the whole East. We cannot suffer that anything which relates to the state of the church, however manifest and unquestionable, should be moved without the knowledge of your holiness, who is the head of all the holy churches. For in all things, as 
we have already declared we are anxious to increase the honor and authority of your apostolic chair. The emperor's letter, continues Mr. Crawley, must have been sent before the 25th of March of 533. For in his letter of that date to Ephenaeus, he speaks of its having been already dispatched and repeats his decision that all affairs touching the church shall be referred to the Pope, head of all bishops, and the true and effective corrector of heretics. The Pope, in his answer, returned the same month of the following year, 534, observes that among the virtues of Justinian, one shines as a star his reverence for the apostolic chair, to which he has subjected and united all the churches, it being truly the head of all. Okay, so what what I don't really get here with with Smith is what does this have to do with 538? I don't think that it has anything to do with it. Yeah, so so he's given us all this background information, but he's going to do the same thing with 538 that he did with 508. He's going to give us all this background, but he doesn't he's not going to give a specific event. Right. right. I mean, he'll deal with Justinian, which is good. I don't know. I just have a problem with this approach. To me, it's kind of a weak approach. Well, as we have, as we've addressed in the past, Smith had not accepted anything having to do with the seven times of Leviticus 26. So when he is specifically and decidedly avoiding that subject, he's not going to see the validity of what had had been addressed by others. Okay, so if we if we look at how we understand Bible prophecy, like there's different ways of looking at the world. So the modern scientific, we'll call it that, method is... Um, has a different different perspective than biblical method of study. Right. Right. So, you know, for instance, uh, you know, if you're going to uh, look at the stories in the New Testament, in the Gospels, and you'll see, you know, a story where it talks about two people that have demons, two demoniacs, and the same story only has one, in our modern mind, we say, oh, there's a contradiction, right? Right. But yet, in reality, that's not a contradiction. That is, the stories and, and the stories of Scripture are not a, uh, you know, a live video feed of what happened. Right? Okay. Right. So the way that the modern world looks at information and facts is different than the way that the Bible looks at it. That it and, and we know this is true. Like when I was a kid, I used to think I was a liar because when I told stories, when I when I told something that happened and I left details out, you know, that is, you know, there's no way I could drop, describe all the details. I thought that that was dishonest. You know, I, it took me, you know, not until I was an adult that I really understood that, um, that when you tell a story, it, it's not it's not true in that absolute sense, right? Because you and, and sometimes you don't even remember exactly who was there or exactly the order of events. And so when you tell a story, like if I'm going to talk about a backpacking trip I had, um, if I told what actually happened and exactly the order it happened and and just described it, you know, as like a move, like a like a, a camera filming the scene, it'd be pretty boring, right? You you have to have the highlights, you have to put things in order. And so the way that, that Smith is approaching it is, is not from a biblical perspective. That is, he's not looking at what the Bible is saying. So when we when we prove, for instance, 723, the thing that I've come to prove it, at least for myself, is that it's part of the larger structure 
of prophecy. Some of these are very precise. Some things I can prove and some things I can't prove. Right? Right. You know what I'm saying? Um, so if, if I was going to look at, let's say, 457 BC on its own, it's pretty hard to prove on its own. Just like it's, it's impossible to prove 677 on its own. But when you put all of the things together, when you put all of the evidences together, 677, you look at the four, seven times and you look at the events of, you know, Israel being taken into captivity by Babylon. And uh, you start to look at all of these details. You have a picture that is impossible to have occurred by chance. And, and the scientific mind thinks that, you know, if you can find fault with just one of those things, one of those dates, um, that you could at least place doubt on it, then somehow the whole structure falls apart. And of course it doesn't because the whole structure is held together. Like all of this work that Stephen's done with these spans of time, with the chronology that we have. Um, if we had a wrong like if the 2300 days was wrong, then that structure wouldn't exist, right? Correct. So so it's such a different way of looking at things. So the way that Smith has done it by trying to prove, you know, 538 or 508, or even if he's going to try to prove 1798, we can see why Adventism brings doubt upon those events because he's really entered upon Satan's ground. He's bought into the premise that is a false premise, right? That, that premise is, is not a biblical premise. It's a modern premise. And, and, and the problem that Adventism has is that it can't prove things, uh, on, on a biblical scope, when you when you have neglected really the way that the Bible works, right? So this this modern way of thinking, you know, by modern I mean that history uh, which we call modernism, right? That's where Uriah Smith is caught up. It's it's a type of scientific modernism, and 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 the church has never recognized this that they're like somebody asked me, you know, where's a good book on uh, biblical uh, epistemology? Like, how do we understand how to study the Bible? Well, there is no good books on it. The only good book I know is the Bible. I mean, we could say the spirit of prophecy, and we could probably say some other books that sort of show us how we could use uh, Lewis F. Weir's books. But the modern mind... And, and Smith is caught up in this. He, he can't help himself because that's the environment that he, he seeks to be in, right? That scholarly world. But he's never examined the basic premises of that world. And he's trying to use those ideas to support the Bible. He's trying to prove to the modern mind that Adventism is true. But you can't. It's not going to be a solid faith because it's not really going to be based on the Bible. And and it's subtle. There's a subtle difference. But that difference is huge, if that makes sense. Do I, you get what I'm talking about there? I do. <clears throat> I don't know if I'm clear or not. Well, Smith is, by the use of very verbose language, he is avoiding addressing the actual subject. Right. Well, he's not very direct. Not usually. You're right. Yeah. See, I mean, if I was writing this, well, you're going to see it when I have my paper. But, you know, I would say, here is the problems. We have 508 and 538. How do we support them from the Bible? How do we support them from history? What is the basis for understanding these things? But he has never laid out his his argument, really. 
right? He's, he's, he's not clear. Now, I believe in being very clear about everything. If I'm going to present something, I'm not going to be using rhetoric, right? I'm not going to be just trying to prove what I think in, in that sense. I'm not trying to, to pull the wool over the eyes of the person that I'm trying to convince. I don't want to convince somebody against their will. I don't want them to be manipulated to believe something on a false premise, right? I want them to clearly see the, the choice and decision they have to make. Because I want to know clearly what the choice is. When I make a decision about something, I want it not to be just an emotional decision or or, or pressure in some way, like I don't want to be pressured by society or by the group that I belong to or anything like that. I want to understand what the truth is based upon God's word, because God's word is the standard. It's how we, we view everything through God's word. And when we don't view everything through God's word, we, we have no way of interpreting the world around us correctly. It's not so much... You know, the question of how do we understand God's word is is like to say, you know, is there a good book on epistemology, you know, for understanding the Bible? I think the other question, the question really should be, um, because the Bible, it's not like we have some way in which we look at the Bible to see whether it's true. We actually use the Bible to see what things are true. The Bible is the window into the world to, to show us what's real. And so there is nothing outside of the Bible that can show us the Bible, if that makes sense, you know, other than the Holy Spirit, but that's part of God's word. Now you're, you're looking to establish your premise and mm -hmm. Smith has definitely not established his premise. No. And, and in a sense, he's accepted a premise that, we need to prove the Bible by science. Right. Now, it's interesting because this letter that Crawley refers to, mm -hmm. written during the time of Pope John II. Pope John II became, was elected to the papacy on the 2nd of January of 533. And it ended on the 8th of May of 535. He is the first of the popes to change his birth name to accept a different name. Because his birth name was Mercury. Mercurius. So he was born in Rome. Became a priest at St. Clement's Basilica on the Callan, Callian Hill. So it's kind of interesting. <clears throat> they have several marble slabs and references to this person before he became pontiff. So as this continued from Smith, the Pope in his answer returned the same month of the following year, 534, observes that among the virtues of Justinian, one shines as a star, his reverence for the apostolic chair, to which he has subjected and united all the churches, it truly being the head of all. The novellum of the Justinian Code gave give unanswerable proof of the authenticity of the title. The preamble of the ninth state that as the elder of Rome was the founder of laws, so was it not to be questioned that in her was the supremacy of the pontificate. The 131st on the Ecclesiastical Titles and Privileges, Chapter 2, states, We therefore decree that the most holy pope of the elder Rome is the first of all, all the priesthood, and the most blessed Archbishop of Constantinople, the new Rome, shall hold the second rank after the Holy Apostolic Chair 
of the elder Rome. Toward the close of the 6th century, John of Constantinople denied the Roman supremacy and assumed for himself the title of universal bishop, whereupon Gregory the Great, indignant at the usurpation, denounced John and declared with unconscious truth that he who would assume the title of universal bishop was Antichrist. Focus in 606 suppressed the claim of the Bishop of Constantinople and vindicated that of the Bishop of Rome. But Focus was not the founder of papal supremacy. Says Crawley that Focus repressed the claim of the Bishop of Constantinople is beyond a doubt. But the highest authorities among the civilians and analysts of Rome spurn the idea that Focus was the founder of the supremacy of Rome. They ascend to Justinian as the only legitimate legitimate source and rightly date the title from the memorable year of 533. Again, he says, on reference to Baronius, the established authority among the Roman Catholic analysts, I found the whole detail of Justinian's grants of supremacy to the Pope formally given. The whole, the entire transaction was of the most authentic and regular kind and suitable to the importance of the transfer. Okay, so um, now, so he's talking here about 606 in focus. So uh, that date was often used as the start of the 1260 by uh, Protestant commentators. Okay. Prior to Miller. Right. Um, now, of course, it's on the 1843 chart uh, dealing with um, Islam. Right. Right. So you see it on there, 606. And that's going to be, uh, you know, when Muhammad begins his uh, um, deception, I guess you would call it. They use another word for it. Um, but. You know, so this thing with focus, I think what he's trying to argue here is that it can't be focus. Right. Right. So he's just saying we have to go back to Justinian. Is that what he's trying to argue here? That we just we wouldn't use the 606 date? Well, he's he's quoting Crowley here. Yeah. So he's using Crowley's arguments. He's not trying to make one of his own. Yeah. But but yeah. But yeah, I understand. It's not his argument, but he's accepting this argument. Okay. Except that he's going to have 533, which we don't mark. Right. Okay. So I'm not really sure what Uri Smith is trying to prove here. So, as he continued, such were the circumstances attending the decree of Justinian. But the provisions of this decree could not at once be carried into effect. For Rome and Italy were were held by the Ostrogoths, who were Arians in faith, and strongly opposed to the religion of Justinian and the Pope. It was therefore evident that the Ostrogoths must be rooted out of Rome before the Pope could exercise the power with which he had been clothed. To accomplish the object, the Italian war commenced in 534. The management of the campaign was entrusted to Belisarius. On his approach toward Rome, several cities forsook, and I'm thinking this is an incorrect spelling, I'm thinking it should be Vitellius, their Gothic and heretical sovereign, and joined the armies of the Catholic Emperor. The Goths Deciding to delay offensive operations till spring allowed Belisarius to enter Rome without opposition. The deputies of the Pope and the clergy of the Senate and the people invited the lieutenant of Justinian to accept their voluntary allegiance. Belisarius entered Rome 10th of December of 536. But this was not an end of the struggle, for the Goths rallying their forces resolved to dispute his possession of the city by a regular siege. This commenced in March of 537. 
Belisarius feared despair and treachery on the part of the people. Several senators and Pope Silverius, on proof of suspicion of suspicion of treason, were sent into exile. The emperor commanded the clergy to elect a new bishop. After solemnly invoking the Holy Ghost, they elected the deacon Vigilus, who, by a bribe of 200 pounds of gold, had purchased the honor. The whole nation of the Ostrogoths had been assembled for the siege of Rome, but success did not attend their efforts. Their hosts melted away in frequency and bloody combats under the walls of the city, and the year and nine days during which the siege lasted witnessed almost the entire consumption of the whole nation. In the month of March 538, dangers beginning to threaten them from other quarters. They raised the siege burned their tents, and retired in tumult and confusion from the city, with numbers scarcely sufficient to preserve their existence as a nation or their identity as a people. Thus the Gothic horn, the last of three, was plucked up before the little horn of Daniel 7. Nothing now stood in the way of the Pope to prevent his exercising the power conferred upon him by Justinian five years before. The saints, times, and laws were now in his hands, not in purpose only, but in fact. And this must therefore be taken as the year when the abomination was placed or set up, and as this point from which to date the period of its supremacy. Okay, so um, that word, that name of that guy is Vitages, so the J should be changed to a G, if you want to correct that. Changed to a G, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Now, so, so again, he has this, this weak argument for 538. So part of it is he's not really establishing exactly how, how, how we're going to, why, why we're going to choose different dates. So he's going to have 533, but he's going to say, well, all this military stuff has to happen before. Now, Stephen, um, is what did you find by what we read here? What's the problems with the history here? Well, I think he was it was good to look at five thirty three just to sort of give us that aspect of the great authority being yeah. bestowed. So, yeah, and we will put the power seat in great authority. We could put that in five thirty three. The great yes. authority, right? So I think it is good to look at 533 to do that initially before you come yeah. to 538 because then uh, you have then the uh, that premise in place mm -hmm. for when that, that authority is there but it's not kind of uh, it doesn't have any liberty because it's being ruled by these these Gothic tribes probably Aryan the Ostrogoths, yeah. I reckon. So they're not going to be supportive of the Bishop of Rome in that aspect. Uh, so then when Belisarius comes, uh, he could have, you could maybe think, well, then the Pope does have that authority, but he kind of right away prepares for this here siege. Yeah. It's, it's not a, they're sort of aware that he doesn't have quite that liberty as yet to sort of begin that 1260 to have that supremacy. So it's only when that siege is then lifted that then that authority is then available to the Pope. In a sense, that, that would be my understanding of what marking the 1260 beginning. So we wouldn't um, have the Sunday law in, uh, in 538? Well, that... Because um, there's a Sunday law legislated... In 538. There is. there is. In Orleans, yes, but it's not in Rome. Okay, yeah. So I, it is interesting. It is worthy of marking, but I don't, I don't think it's the marker for the 1260. Okay, so you're going to agree with Smith here for marking the 1260? Yes, I, I'm saying that that great authority then has then can be... <coughs> uh, um, 
I, I believe there, there's something there that's going on that that authority then can be justified to to be bestowed. At some okay. level, it, maybe maybe not having the great. You no, know, it takes time for that pope to acquire that authority. You can't just all of a sudden start. Okay, mm. I now have this authority of the, and I'm going to start burning heretics. That doesn't happen. No, but there's a. I think there's something in that in the realm, spiritually that that, that begins that period and uh, initiates the twelve sixty. Even though the Ostrogoths are going to come back, and um, uh, in, in later times, like a, a few years later, and uh, Belisarius, the, the Rome's going to be. There's going to be a back and back and forth going on, okay. for un, until about five fifty three before the Ostrogoths are totally defeated. Okay. You know, so, um, okay. So um, uh, Heidi Hikes in uh, Chapter 10 of that, I, I sent you the 538 document as well. You probably see that there. All right, okay, thanks. To the 538 source book as well as the 508. Now he says in Chapter 10, uh, Justinian, the first Catholic emperor in 62 years to have subdued and reclaimed Rome, established his legal jurisdiction in the West for the first time since the fall of Western Rome in AD 476. With Rome known as the, to the world at that time as the capital of the world, Justinian dethroned the Ostrogoths, the last of those three Aryan governments, who held to the principle of religious liberty. Justinian's legal jurisdiction included the Sunday law legisl legislated throughout all of Christendom in AD 538. With the mark of the Catholic Church's ecclesiastical authority then enforced, church and state openly defied the God of heaven and earth. So would you agree with that paragraph? Uh, I'd have to read it again just to uh, kind of... Yeah. Just that, well, the idea is that the Sunday law is list legislated throughout all of Christendom in AD 538. Mm -hmm. so, so anyway, um, take a look. I kind of am hesitant to... I think it's the markers, but just to say all Christendom, you know, there's areas where the, their authority is not established. You know, there's Christian groups, maybe Ethiopia and so forth, that are Christian but are not, no. have, have no connection. Maybe the fringes of Europe, Ireland and so forth, that they they know nothing of that. Sunday law, yeah. you know. Well, yeah, possibly. Okay, anyway, well, you would take a look at, at this. So, you know, put together some studies on 508 to 538 um, for us um, in some way, but it's for some point, whenever that's going to be. Because I don't think we're ready right now to delve into this in too much detail. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to at some point. I think I should have a document on 538 somewhere. I can... Uh... Use that as a maybe it could do with being added to, or maybe more information added and so forth. But uh, I will uh, I can maybe try and dig it out. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Dwight. Okay, I'm going back to the first portion of this paragraph. Belisarius entered into Rome, 10th of December of 536. When we look at this, it becomes very interesting because the 10th of December of 536 A.D. has a biblical parallel in Ezekiel 24, verse 1. Is there anything that we can draw as far as conclusions from these parallels? Because according to when we do the calculation of the date, the 10th of December of 536 would have been the 10th day of the ninth month in the biblical year. Okay, and you're marking that for where? Like, Okay, we have right here. Yeah, so you got the 10th. So you got December 10th, 536. Okay. So what are you comparing that to? What date? That using the biblical convert, the calendar converter, yeah, it's the 10th day, 9th month. month. Now, take a look at Ezekiel 24, verse 1. 
Yeah. So in the ninth year, in the tenth month, that's the tenth day of the month. That's the tenth, tenth month, tenth day, ninth okay. year. Okay. My fault. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's because uh, because uh, I don't know of a tenth day of ninth month, but we could say December being the tenth month and the tenth day. That would give us the tenth day of the tenth month. Okay. So siege. Now, at different times, uh, they've started the year. Like, I think it's, what, February 20? Like, like, they didn't start the year on, like, March 1st. It was um, February. I always forget the date for some reason. And it's going to be in different places that they start the year at different times. Yeah, February. Uh, let me see here. It's, it's, it's kind of, Okay. Uh, the ordinary year of the previous Roman calendar consists of 12 months for a total of 355 days. In addition, a 27 or 28 day intercalary month, sometimes inserted between February and March. So this is, the intercalary month was formed by inserting 22 or 23 days after the first 23 days of February. Okay, that's that's their lunar calendar, not their Julian calendar. Um, uh, I can't remember. It's like February 28th or something like that. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, uh, the, the point is March is the first month. April's the second month. May is the third month, etc. So that's why we have the name December for the 12th month of our calendar, because originally it was the 10th month, right? November, that has to do with the number nine. October, the number eighth, September, the number seven, right? So you can see that preserved in the names of the months. So, so you do get the 10th day of the 10th month symbol, right? So that has to do with the siege, okay. right? That's the start of the siege. But is, is that what it's saying here? Or is the siege start in March 537? No, he sure. was there and then the, the siege begins i mean like it's it's saying here this was not the end of the struggle for the goths rallied their forces so the outside the external event of the goths deciding to play siege to rome commenced in march of 537 okay anyway so we got that so the siege is going to be from 537 to 538 now they have uh, belisarius entering on december 9th 536 in Wikipedia. Okay. So not December 10th. So I'm not sure why the discrepancy. Okay. So as we had covered this, they start their siege, March of 537. The siege is lifted, March of 538. And Smith places this as the plucking of the Gothic horn. The last of the three. But Stephen, you did a study on this before. So do you agree with that? That the, uh, the siege began in March and so forth? Well, yeah, and also that the plucking of the Gothic horn occurs here in 538. No, I disagree with that. I, I would normally place it in 552 or right now or 553. Because the Goths come back, they take Rome again, I think yeah. in around 540. And there's several battles going on between them and Eastern Rome. Okay. And uh, I think it's it's not Belisarius, but it's another general of uh, the Eastern Roman Empire that actually defeats the Ostrogoths. So. So yeah. the idea, so the idea that he has here is that these three horns, once the third one's plucked up in the 538 date is marked to start the 1260 and you're saying that that's mm -hmm. now of mm -hmm. course we know that the goth still continue no is it not possible that this here would still start the 1260 even though the goths still continue or how do you how do you deal with the three horns being plucked up well three horns are plucked up but it just i just think it's it's over a period of about 60 years. I think it's 493 okay. is the first one. 
And that's reasonable, right? Like they don't have to be plucked up to start the 1260. No, it's the, the, the stool of the great authority initiating that there, I think that's the, the 1260. The, the three plugging up happens around that time, but not, yeah. it's, it's, it's not so much connected to the 1260. Uh, right. Some people have made it. Right. So we know that, that there are many Adventists. They use the three horns being plucked up to start the 1260. When you show them that that's not the case, then they're not sure what to do. Right. And, and again, you know, to sort of belabor this point, but part of the problem is we're not really understanding how to, how these prophetic periods work how to mark their beginning, right? Um, and how to, how to mark ends of prophetic periods. And if you use the sort of method that people are trying, it, it's almost arbitrary what events that we choose. It's like we start with the dates and then we find something to fit. And that's not how we do things from a biblical perspective. We need to understand the prophecies clearly what they're representing and and then what what uh, events would mark those that that it can't be just because there's so many different events all the time that people can just kind of choose whatever event they want to create whatever period of time they want and we're saying that that's not the case that these structures are connected to other things so one of the things we have is we have the 666 years of Miller that's attached to 1335 years. And it's attached to another 1335, and we got the two different 1290s, and we got uh, the two 1260s, right? So we have all of these structures that fit together, where, and then we can mark th- these events, they're actually tied together um, with symbols, right? Right. So, like, for instance, the baptism of Clovis being December 25th, that, that marks it as a symbol for that period of time, right? Does that make sense? Okay. So, but yeah, so this is a problem with the horn, the, the, the three horns being plucked up theory is it doesn't really work to start the 1260. So I, I don't, I don't know when we should, you know, spend more time looking at this. Uh, uh, Stephen, what, what's your schedule like over this week as far as time to do if you were going to do a presentation on 508 and 538. Yeah, I'm just sort of uh, getting back to doing work. I'm sort of way behind with jobs. People are asking me okay. to, to do this and that. So I don't know. It's maybe not this week. It would be a good week. Okay. Maybe so so we won't week. do it right away, right? We'll just, we'll just keep this on the back burner for now. Okay. But we are going to have to look at it in more detail. And especially in regard to 538 and the Sunday law, because that to me is what I would mark. Um, Because, you know, 508, we have December 25th. That's a symbol of the Sunday law. And then in 538, we actually have a Sunday law. And and I would tie those symbols together. But we have to look at that in more detail. Okay, Dwight? Okay. So we're now at the point where, as we are now going to end Smith's portion in reference to verse 31 and his statements using Mr. Crowley, we now come to verse 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Those that forsake the covenant, the holy scriptures, and think more of the decrees of popes and the decisions of councils than they do of the word of God, these shall he, the pope, corrupt by flatteries. That is, lead them on in their partisan zeal for himself by the bestowment of wealth, of position, and of honors. So we so we addressed this in in our study um, that such as do wickedly against the covenant. Um, so one of the things we noticed about this word against um, seven five six one 
And I'm just going to look at it just to be clear. So, Rasha. And, and this word is not the common word. So, so this is not really against. It's such as do wickedly against. So the word there is wickedly. Rasha. Yeah. Right? So, um, and I'm trying to figure out why they have it as against. What they're doing here. Such as do wickedly against. I think it's just kind of implied. So the form of the word, yeah, because, you know, the word against is, 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 is added. I mean, I don't know why they don't put it in italics. And, uh, but what you have is in, in the Hebrew, of course, you have the vav connecting the beginning of the sentence, like and, and right? And then they have a mem, right? And, and that's probably what he's, they're translating as against, though often it means from but it can mean against. And then Rashia e Rashia e. So they've they have a so that is making it masculine. So I don't know why they say such as do wickedly. Let me just hang on a second here. I'm just looking at this a little more. So this is the Hithel participle. Okay. So I don't know if I put such as do wickedly. I don't think that's part of the sentence, but it's got to be something. So, you know, there's no, it's actually not masculine. It's not plural. It's, uh, anyway. So against a barit, um, that's the covenant. So such as do wickedly. So it's in the hifil form. It's just, so in, um, you deal with it. So one of the things we looked at this word is it, it has the same digits as 7651, which is the seven times. So, but it's 7561 instead of 7651. And so it can mean to do condemn as guilty uh, or to act wickedly. So we're going to have it as acting wickedly. And so they act wickedly against the covenant. Now, the way that we understood that, and I know our time is up here, but then we'll come back to this tomorrow. But yes. we would say that this is against God's covenant, and this is done through the Sunday law legislation in 538. Right. So it's referring to doing wickedly, you know, this power that seeks to ch change times and laws. Right. And so in order to uh, promote itself, it's going to use flattery. And those that do not know their God shall be strong, or, or that do know their God, pardon me, shall be strong. And that's going to be the 144,000 in our history. In that history, it's the women in the wilderness, right? So this is dealing with the Sunday law in our time. So there's a parallel to our time. So it's taking the Sunday law in 538, and, and we compare it then to the Sunday law in the present time. So anyway, we'll come back to this tomorrow with a little more detail. Okay. Any other thoughts, comments, or questions at this point? Thank you each for your participation, and shall we close with a word of prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we've been able to spend together. We ask you now, Father, for your guidance, your direction, and your blessing. Help us that we may consider these things further. Be with us through this day, and may our words, our actions bring glory to your name and to your character. For this we thank you and this we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.